Okay. Sure. Um, I don't know what time it is. Do we have a time? Okay. All right. So, okay. Um, our, our, so finally, we have our law enforcement here all together, and I cannot tell you this is this is the source of my anxiety, really. Well, <laughs> and, and I mean that in a good way. <laughs> sorry, it's the red lights that usually accompany you. I'm sorry, I can't help it. <laughs> um, not that I've ever had a speeding ticket. Or, um, no, it's truly my heart. My heart was worried for a Tiffany. This is uh, the trauma. I mean, I just I just had a high level of anxiety, but excitement as well because we are moving forward. We have more people. We have more representation from law enforcement and nonprofits, and this is fantastic. So I'm going to just tell you the three um, departments we have here. Uh, if you don't know already, Detective Thickens with the Hartford Police Department. He's going to be discussing, and I'm just kind of re just a ca short recap. I'm sure they'll be saying a lot more, but discussing the importance of reporting tips um, and, and community involvement in this topic. Captain Martin Schultes with the Washington County Sheriff's Office. Very excited to have the captain here tonight discussing uh, all sorts of things as well. But recent federal changes, federal federal and state legislation changes, and. Um, things that were voted in and shot down and um, all of that important stuff. And uh, and then Sheriff Dale Schmidt with the Dodge County Sheriff's Department. And um, Sheriff Schmidt has been on radio and been promoting this um, a lot. And I'm really grateful for all he's doing as well. Uh, he's going to talk about things like discussing what town boards and others in communities, including his community, which are already doing um, to fight this issue. So I think we're going to start with Detective, Detective Thickens, if that's okay. And because I don't, I, I only know how Sheriff Schmidt can talk. I know he's a long talker, so I'm keeping him at the end. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, I am too, so oh well. <laughs> but um, I don't know how much these other two speak, so we're going to start with you. I'll be quick. Thanks for coming. <laughs> really appreciate it. I'm, I'm, you don't need I'm, it I'm noisy too. Okay, good. Um, so Rich Thickens from Harker PD, and let's say it's not quite right um, it's awesome to see this number of people here. Um, I was actually very much surprised when I walked in the stream was this many people here, which is awesome. Um, so really, I want to talk about you being the eyes and ears of the community, okay? Um, and I can't talk a lot about uh, Tiffany's case, but in Tiffany's case, I was fortunate that we have a survivor, and I love that term now, it's going to be that, not victim. Um, survivor who was strong and was willing to talk to me. Um, and, but I'll tell you that that's not the first exposure I had to this case. She's the first one that's willing to talk to me, okay? Um, so very often, if you see something and you tell us, you know, we may reach out to the person and they may not be ready to talk to us, okay? But that at least puts them on our radar. We at least know that they're there. And there's a, uh, in the handout, there's a, a indicator of risks mm -hmm. that's great. Okay, and, and you may see something on there and you say, oh, this, okay, I see a concern here. Bring it to us, okay? If it turns out to be nothing, so what? It's nothing. It, all it costs is a few minutes of our time to follow up on it, okay? It doesn't take anything more than that. And having contact with someone who might not be ready to talk, you know, but at least has that seed planted, hey, there's someone who's willing to talk to me, okay? We're, we're, we're one small piece of this puzzle, okay, as she's already pointed out. There, there are many other pieces. Um, maybe they don't want to talk to us, okay? But there are other resources, resources out here, okay? Um, you know, obviously, in law enforcement, obviously our goal is, is the criminal prosecution of these cases so we can stop them. But the more immediate goal is getting a survivor out of that situation, okay? And the prosecution can come later. So maybe they're not willing to talk to us, but maybe they're willing to talk to friends. Maybe they're willing to talk to, you know, a, a faith-based organization, anything. Something that they can, someone they can talk to. And if it starts with us, great. If it starts with someone else, that's great too, okay? So you're the eyes and ears, okay? Um, so there are, we recognize in law enforcement that this is an underreported crime, okay? Not everybody's willing or able to come forward and talk, okay? So we recognize that. And we recognize that we have partners in the community, whether it's other law enforcement organizations, other members of the community that can work 
with us, okay? And that's what our goal is, always is. Um, you know, Tiffany may mention it's, it, we don't have a lot of exposure to this, okay? Thankfully, we're a small community. We don't have a lot of exposure. I will say it's not our first case, okay? We've had other cases. Obviously, nothing that's gone to the scope at this point, but there have been others, all right? So um, we're continually trying to improve our response, okay? and that can be a, a more trauma approach, more trauma centered approach to talking to survivors. And we're working on that. Um, and we'll improve on that. But if we don't know about victims, we don't want to talk to them. Okay? So that's that's what we need to help with. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Right. Oh, could you could you just um, talk about the just real quick? Oh yeah. Right, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, I about so the uh, Washington County has a sexual assault response team, and we're doing a. It's called the Walk a Mile in Our Shoes. It's a, it's a national walk, um, but we're we're doing it this year on April 28th. Um, it's actually going to start on Saturday the 28th at 10:30 a.m. is registration. Uh, it starts at the uh, West Bend Tap and Tavern. Um, you get to come out and watch me walk in size 12 high heels. Um, I'll tell you, I have a newfound respect for anybody who can do that. I do it for a mile in 15 minutes, and then I'm done. Um, it's it's really its purpose is to raise awareness. Um, one, to let victims know that we're out there, okay, and that there are people in the community that care about them and, and are willing to help. Um, and that, you know, to make it also, as we're doing here, to raise awareness about these issues in our community. Thanks. Appreciate that. Thank you. All right, so um, is anybody hot? Should we open the door? These people can. The library closed it. Oh, they closed it? They're too loud? <laughs> is that me? <laughs> That's my microphone. All right, I'm just going to talk without it then. Um, okay, so I guess we'll li listen next to Captain Martin Schultes, who was so gracious enough to come and speak with us today. I've been wanting to engage the Washington County um, Sheriff's Office and uh, to no avail, and I really didn't, I mean, I was really more or less, I'm not gonna, this is not a negative thing, I, I don't wanna be negative at all, because I've not really like stepped in the door and made the phone call, just like these annoying emails that some of you know about. Um, so I just was doing some of that to the sheriff, and um, so I'm so grateful, though, seriously, that you're here to talk with us today and engaging the uh, Washington County Sheriff's Office, so that we can know your face and, and know that you're engaged. Well, thank you very Please much. welcome. To start with, I wasn't aware of those emails. Just for, for the <laughs> That's true. Kind of fluke. Uh, they did a presentation uh, was a couple months ago, mm -hmm. a month ago or month so, ago? up at uh, West Bend, and I just happened to be going by, and I, I saw it on social media, but I stopped in, and uh, I was kind of intrigued. And uh, Deacon Steve, just for, just for the record, I stole your phone number back then, so I just got it my phone. So. <laughs> Um, so what I wanted to do is just kind of give you an, an over my, um, my position, by the way, as I'm the administrative captain of the, the sheriff, Washington County Sheriff's Office, and I also serve as the uh, the under sheriff for the uh, the office of the sheriff for the uh, kind of the vice president of the, of the organization, so to speak. Um, but if you're not aware of how, how countywide law enforcement works, the uh, the sheriff's office handles areas that don't have a, a primary police department. So like the city of, of Hartford here is in Washington County, well, it's in Dodge County as well. Uh, but they have their own police department, so they do the primary law enforcement. And we assist them. And the same thing with West Bend, Germantown, Slinger, uh, uh, Jackson. Um, so they all have their individual police departments. So I can't really speak to the, uh, the, 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 their specific cases. But what I want to kind of do is kind of give you a flavor of uh, the sheriff's department's uh, experience with it. And what I did is I went back over the past couple of years, and uh, one, one case is too many, by the way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I want to thank Tiffany for coming up here. I can't imagine the courage it took for you to be up here. It's easy for law enforcement. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have an easy job compared to, to what, uh, what Tiffany did tonight. Um, but uh, so we don't have a whole lot of those cases. Um, we have a, several, a couple, one, two, three a year. And like I said, one is too many. Um, but like Detective Vickin said, it is exponentially underreported. So I, I don't even want to say we, don't, we only had three cases last year, because that's, that's what was reported to us. That's not what occurred. So uh, statistics can be very, very misleading. Um, so um, what I can say is a vast, we've had some self-initiated cases that we've, we've instituted, 
but a vast majority of those all come down to citizens that report something to us. And it's exactly what Detective Thicken says. If you see something, say something type of thing. And what I'd like to do is just give you a couple of, of quick examples of uh, cases that, uh, um, that were reported to us and how they were reported to us. Uh, one of the very common ways is uh, we'll have a, a concerned neighbor that will see a vehicle pull up to, uh, to a, a, a subdivision and uh, park a couple hundred feet away Driver stays in the vehicle, a young female gets out, walks up to the front door, the female is in the house for half hour, 45 minutes, an hour. Um, now, it could be innocent, it could be a drug deal, it could be human trafficking. And we've had several cases over the past couple years where it's been exactly that. Um, so that, that is probably one of the most common ways. Uh, one of the most disturbing cases that we investigated was back in 2016, and it involved a 48-year-old stepfather that was from somewhere down south, Alabama, Mississippi, something like that. He has a 16-year-old stepdaughter and then three other children, ages like four to eight in that neighborhood. They left down south, I don't want to say to evade prosecution, but to get away from social services. So they came up here. The wife decided not to live with the stepfather. So the wife is, is not there. So it's, it's the 16-year-old and the, the three kids that bounce between mom and stepdad. So what, what happened is that, uh, in essence, the 48-year-old stepfather was, A, sexually abusing his 16-year-old stepdaughter, um, neglecting the three younger kids, and worse yet, was farming her out, prostituting her over Craigslist. And uh, the, the only reason that came to light to us, and this is kind of my point, is we had a contractor that was working in the house for uh, over like several weeks. And it was a, a contractor that, uh, I don't remember what he did, if it was a drywall or a masonry, but it created a lot of dust. And so what does that, what does that matter? But what happened is that the kids had a basement downstairs, 16 year old had a basement, or a, a bedroom upstairs rather, and then the master uh, bedroom for dad, stepdad was upstairs as well. But what this contractor noticed is that he's creating all this dust. And he's noticing that there's never any tracks going into the 16-year-old bedroom mm -hmm. over two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. And there was just a couple of other things, just some verbal things that just didn't sound right to him. And uh, one, he got a peek inside the master bedroom one day, just there was a sliver to open a little bit, and he saw some, some girls' clothes inside the, the bedroom. That's not right, okay, and that's kind of my point. That just is not, it doesn't, it's, a normal person would say that something doesn't uh, doesn't add up there. So what happened? They um, he contacted us. Uh, he did it anonymously, matter of fact, um, and we we tried to uh, to do that when we can. And uh, uh, we were able to speak with the the 16 year old, who uh, ironically that they, they pulled out of school up here to, to homeschool. So there was very little there was very little connection to the community at all. Child was basically kept in the house, and uh, we were eventually able to figure out that uh, um, that dad we got the phone from the 16-year-old. That every 16-year-old has to have a phone, and uh, we were able to determine that uh, um, that a the, the sexual assault was going on, and b that it was occurring um, over Craigslist. And, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, Craigslist in, in just a little bit, um, but uh, that that is is just one of those. Small examples of just somebody reporting it to us and, uh, and, and stopping it. That monster was arrested, charged, and uh, he's in prison now. Right? And I don't know what happened to the, the rest of the family. Um, my other exposure to it, can I just get some water? Yeah, yeah. Okay, is this one? Is this yours? Okay. Um, my other exposure to it is I was the. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, deputy incident commander for the U.S. Open that occurred last last uh, summer down in down in Aaron, and I'll, I'll have to give this group you don't know this story, no. but I'll have to give this group uh, uh, Wendy credit because uh, um, I just heard about some public presentations that were going on about it, and I started thinking to myself. Yeah, I, I was so worried about uh, we had about 40, 50 law enforcement agencies. If, if, if they were wearing a badge, they were there from postal inspectors to uh, it, it was just amazing. Everyone was there. And so some of that stuff, I was more worried about bombs and propane deliveries and fertilizer. But I, I heard the background of what these, this, uh, this 
the you probably got my email. Uh, <laughs> maybe, yeah. But I heard you were doing some presentation at a local church. That's what kind of struck, struck I, it me. Might have, it might have been, at, well, either, or, you know, like Splite, either Exploit No More was doing things, Lisa's okay. whole project. There, is, yes, there are a lot of it was, it was one, but I, I yeah. remember your name okay. attached to it, so okay. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll give you credit for <laughs> it. Um, in the end, because then I started thinking, well, yeah, this is probably kind of a breeding ground for the possibility. We have a, a lot of a lot of money coming in here. We have homes that are being sublet out. There's, there's hotels and motels around. Um, so what we did is uh, uh, we sent, just a, as a preemptive measure, we, uh, we sent so, several of our detectives to some human trafficking training just so they could recognize some of the signs of it. Um, they could be a little more effective doing interviews for it. Um, I reached out to the police chief in Oakmont, uh, Pennsylvania, to see if they had any problems with it. Now, they didn't. Not to say that they weren't aware of it either. It's uh, they're a suburb of Pittsburgh, so they could very well that Pittsburgh had a, a much bigger impact over there. Um, so we didn't experience anything. Not to say it didn't happen, but it did bring awareness, and, it, and that's what this group is really starting to do: is to bring awareness to law enforcement that this, you know, it's we, we know what's happening, but it's nice that there's uh, these organizations that are kind of bringing it to the forefront as well. Um, so I guess uh, what I the other thing I wanted to kind of just touch on is some of the legislation that has been going on. Some of it failed, <clears throat> some of it passed over the past year. One of the most substantial ones, I don't know if you've heard of FOSTA. It's the Fight Online Sex Trafficking Act. It's the HR 1865, it's a federal law. The best thing that ever happened for, for law enforcement for uh, online trafficking. Because what it did is it shifted some of the criminal and civil liability onto the web hosts, the people that are hosting these types of sites, that they condone it, that they profit from it, that they, they are knowledgeable about it, and it has had a direct impact. Uh, if any of you go on Craigslist right now, the personal issues are, are personnel ads, personal ads are down. And if you click on it, it'll open up and it'll say, you can't do this anymore, FOSTA 1865 prohibits us. And that, from our experience, Craigslist is, uh, is a, a, just a breeding ground for that. And the other one is uh, Backpage, if any of your kids, if you see Backpage anywhere, you don't have to worry about it now, because what happened because of that law, the federal government seized it, it's, it's gone. So that, that, is just, uh, that was just a very powerful law that was just, uh, just instituted. A couple other ones in Wisconsin over, over the past year in the state legislature. Some of these didn't pass, um, but I just thought I'd just bring it up, uh, just so you're aware of it. But there's a... Um, the uh, one that did pass, that's, that's the governor did not sign yet, but it's uh, crimes that are subject to a mandatory minimum. It's a uh, Senate bill, it's 55. And what it did is that if you have a prior offense for a couple of, of, of uh, typical types of crimes, that it automatically there's a, a minimum if you have any other conviction for another crime. And just to give you the, the, uh, the flavor of what these crimes are, they're serious stuff. I mean, it's first degree, even second degree, reckless homicide, homicide by intoxicated use of a vehicle, uh, aggravated battery, mayhem, taking hostages, kidnapping, uh, um, damage by explosive, carjacking, robbery, bank robbery. But one of them is child trafficking. So you can see that, that, I mean, those are all serious crimes, but you can tell, I mean, child trafficking, the, the state legislature is looking at this like, this is serious stuff. So that one has passed. It's not, uh, it's not into law yet. This next one did not pass, um, but I thought it's just kind of interesting that, uh, um, that I wanted you guys to know about it. It was brought up in both the Assembly and the Senate. It's a prostitution crime surcharge. And it was proposed that the bill creates a $5,000 surcharge to be imposed on persons who are convicted of patronizing or soliciting prostitutes, <coughs> pandering, keeping place of prostitution. And under the, uh, the bill, the surcharge amount collected is supposed to be used for treatment and services for sex trafficking victims and for criminal investigation related to internet crimes. Now, it, it didn't, like I said, it didn't pass. Uh, and and I, I don't know why, um, but what I think is that the reason why some of these laws are starting to appear in the legislature is because of some of the grassroots efforts that are, are coming from, from groups like this and the awareness that's, that's taking place. Um, there's also another one that didn't pass, um, same type of thing, I and mean, it was both in the Assembly and the Senate. There was a driver education um, provision that when a 16-year-old gets their driver's license at a tech school, that there had to be a section on indication Realizing indicators for human trafficking. Um, that one did, did not pass either. Uh, one that did pass, actually was signed by the governor, um, is administrative subpoenas. Um, it makes it, much, the bill uh, expands the administrative subpoena process to include hotels as possible recipients of administrative subpoenas. 
that includes human trafficking crimes as violations where administrative subpoenas can be issued. So it, it's a it's a crime fight, basically a crime fight tool and a tool in the toolbox that we can use uh, to uh, to get uh, subpoenas because obviously hotels, motels, that they can be an area where that happens. So that's really all I had. I don't know if you wanted to open up for questions that later on. I, I think we'll do, well, does anybody have a couple questions now? We can do a couple now, we won't go too far, and then we'll go ahead. Well, Leslie, first. extends up to Fond du Lac, up to Appleton, Oshkosh, Fox Valley, up to Green Bay. And there's, there's usually one way to get there. That's that big interstate out there. And I can't tell you the amount of crime that goes up and down that interstate, and including the one to Dodge County, 41 and Highway 60. That's, that's how they, they go that way. Um, so we've actually developed pretty good relationships with, uh, uh, and we're not blaming the truck stops and the gas stations, and, and the, you, know, you can't blame Cabela's big parking lot for the problem. But we've, we have a very good relationship with all of those uh, businesses along 41 um, that they, they report stuff to us. And uh, um, so that it's all part of the community involvement, community awareness. Steve? I just wanted to make an observation on the bill that didn't pass with the $5,000 surcharge. And there's still a sympathy element for the Johns family. And, and I get that, but until people really start demanding something happens to the Johns that are that are renting women's bodies, it, the state legislature will not act. Um, it's hard to prove cases. Um, it, it, it's hard to catch. But when they do, um, as I've heard over and over again. The guys typically say, well, this is the first time I've ever done this. And, and, and so, it was a sympathy. If we want it to stop, there has to be a parallel education track on keep reinforcing to men. And I've been doing the work going on 23 years, and when you have 70% of men now in this lots of years of research, who worship every, every week, who are viewing pornography or entertaining the ideas. I mean, it's really trying to get to the heart of, of a lot of these guys, to reach them where they're at, um, but also to put pressure on government. I'm not gonna say it's gonna stop it, but I think it will have an impact long term in getting law enforcement resource, resources that they need and getting survivors resources that they need. Thanks. One more question and then we'll have more at the very, very end. Does anybody have one more? So, so on, uh, on that note, is there any update on, I thought I heard something about there were some new laws coming up or legislation that people were working on to target the buyers of the job. Uh, for a sterner punishment to, to make these people, you know, have to face the music. I don't so know. Speak. I don't know. Do you, Deacon Steve, do you know of any? Nothing. No. There's conversation. conversation. I haven't heard of any legislation that's going to be introduced yet. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Thank you sure. very much. Sure. I want to just um, I want to put this back up a little. So I just want to interject in before we go to um, share Schmidt. So I wanted I forgot to say this in the beginning. Um, in case you didn't see, April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And I want to be sure to point out we have Friends Inc. Um, items. That's our Domestic Violence Sexual Violence Resource Center in Washington County. And it's, it's um, located in West Bend. So there's information right here. I think this is really important that everybody who has any concern about anything or knows somebody or has a friend or a family member grabs this resource and, or a business card or a bracelet or a cool pen. And then I want to put a face to that organization. Heidi Kilborn has been fantastic and has always been supportive in coming. That organization is always been. So again, I just want to make sure you see who these people are. These people are here. We don't always know these. So you hear the names, oh, we should call so-and-so, and there's, there's a thing on a, on a um, website, and it doesn't feel personal. But um, although that video that was just posted from friends um, on their Facebook page, it's on your website probably too, I or I don't know. It's good, yeah, it's on friends. It's on, it's on the, by friends. It's on the website too, though, I mean? I saw it on the oh, okay. website. Okay, it is, yes. It's on Facebook and the website. Okay, perfect. And it's fantastic. But I mean, that's perfect because it kind of make it, it personalizes an organization that's dealing with a very sensitive issue. So um, I highly recommend. So okay, on that note, um, uh, so Sheriff Schmidt has been speaking out on this issue along with many other things. He's very transparent. I don't know if you follow him on Facebook. I do. <laughs> Um, I don't stalk, I just look, <laughs> keep tabs on you, um, and it's fascinating to me how much information he, and I'm not talking about cases, but just um, how much information he's putting out there in, in hopes to pull in some community members and let, and in my opinion, and this isn't coming from him, but I'm assuming this is to engage them, right, to engage us in the community. I mean, if he's being transparent and out there and honest, why aren't we in return? And I really feel so strongly that it takes that both both of us, us and them, and us, I don't want to say us and them, that didn't sound right, but um, to work together to be sure that we are not saying, why aren't you doing something, but instead saying, what more can we do? You know what I mean? That's how I feel about it anyway. So, um, so on that note, share. Schmidt from the Dodge County Sheriff Department. Well, you won't have to say Sheriff Schmidt from Dodge County for, for very much longer because in eight months, uh, the original is going to be retiring, unfortunately, I'm gonna miss him. And uh, he didn't say this because he's actually working in capacity and you really can't talk about it right now, but I'm an elected official, I can talk about whatever I want to. Um, <laughs> The guy that was just up here looks very sheriff-like, doesn't he? Watch for that name come November. Um, you, may, you may be seeing that as, as your next Washington County Sheriff. So it um, wouldn't be a bad, bad check. Um, that there's, I'm done with my political push. Um, so uh, I'd like to think that, yes, I can talk. I am a politician. Uh, but I'd like to think that what she really meant to say was, I'm your headliner tonight. So, that's you know, right. <laughs> yes, that's what I meant. Yes. Yes. Who of you were here the last time I came and spoke to you? Do you have, how many of you remember me saying, you may see something in the future uh, because we are working on some things, and lo and behold, Mr. Child is in custody. Yeah. We're not done. I'm not going to talk about it, but we're not done. We are going to continue to work on this issue. We are going to continue to uh, uh, make this, bring this to the forefront. But as I said last time, we can't do this alone. We need your help. Just as Detective Thicken said, just as Captain Schulte said, we need your help to get this done. And you need to educate yourself. You being here tonight is an excellent way to do that. Uh, but what is it that you can do to help us? Well, how many of you in here know your county, town, or village, or city councilmen, council persons, or board members? It's a good start. Get everybody on board with that. Because that's where it starts. 
I give a lot of credit to the town of Kleinman, not the village of Kleinman, they're two different entities. The town of Kleinman does not have jurisdiction over the hardware store. Isn't that a great name for a strip club, the hardware store? <laughs> Honey, go to the hardware store for a while. Um, that's about the only thing I'll give props for. Um, but uh, the town of Kleinman had foresight. They started looking at a business that went for sale that they thought, we don't want this type of a business in our township. So they passed two ordinances over the last couple of months, and the last one was last week when they, they finally enacted it, that restricts this kind of activity from occurring, that restricts new dancing, that restricts the, the uh, strip club from really coming into the town of Kleinman. And then I said to them, because I was at this meeting, what about a uh, demerit point system? Do you have anything like that in place? Because a few months back, the town of Lebanon came to me and said, what can we do? This was after the shooting that we had down in, in Lebanon. You may have heard about that. What can we do? We don't have any control over these establishments. I said, it's implemented a, a demerit point system against a liquor license. If there's no liquor license, who's going to go there? So that's what they did. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure that they've got it passed. But if they haven't, they're still working on it. But that's what they're doing. They are, they establish, they're working on establishing a liquor license. Town of Climate's working on that too. Now what happens? I can tell you, and I'm guessing that any other law enforcement with a, with a strip club in their jurisdiction will tell you that there are going to be incidents at those locations. I guarantee you that we likely would have been able to uh, levy some kind of a demerit point or points against the Lebanon establishment had one been in place at that point. Now there is one. And if they don't clean up their act, it makes it a lot easier to shut them down. And when these things do happen, and when the FBI does come in, or when our investigators go in and they establish these uh, cases and bring charges against these people, we have some power to take away that liquor license and shut them down. So I'm telling you, that's the first thing that you all need to do is call your supervisors, call your board members, councilmen, whoever they're called in your particular jurisdiction, and tell them you're very concerned. You don't know when this is going to pop up. They may say, well, you know, we don't have any place that's really open right now. Get it on the book so it's done and over with, so you're not battling it later. Get it done. Get the ordinances in place, and make sure they go through an attorney. I know some of the townships like to just do things yeah, we'll just pass this. It'll be, no, get an attorney involved and make sure it's going to be able to be upheld in a court of law so that they can't come back with a lawsuit and win. That's what you can do. That's the first step I think you can do to help keep these places out of your, out of your municipalities, out of your cities, out of your townships. That's a great place to start. What else can we do? Obviously, um, we have organizations that thrive on this type of activity. Uh, the original intent for me to come here wasn't necessarily to talk about what's going on over the last couple of weeks. But you may have heard about something that happened up in the Myra in that of the Outlaws. Now, I'm not claiming that the Outlaw Motorcycle Club is involved in this. What I will tell you is that in the past, some motorcycle, the one percenter motorcycle clubs, the one percenters are the ones that's outside the law not the 99% that are within the, all within the law, those individuals tend to be involved in criminal activity. That criminal activity includes drug use. It includes sex trafficking. It includes just about any other crime that you can name. Weapons violations. I'm not going to let that happen in Lamira. We're letting them know we're not going to let that happen in Lamira. But I guarantee you they're going to try and there are a lot of people who are coming in saying, oh, they're just a motorcycle club, let them be. If they're going to behave themselves, they have nothing to worry about. But we are going to watch them. We are going to keep an eye on them. We are going to continue to keep the pressure on to make sure they know that we are there. And if they break the law, if they bring these things into our community, we are going to be there to act. If they don't do anything wrong, they have nothing to worry about. And I'll say it over and over and over again. But what would you in this room say to me if I knew they came in knew that they had that history, didn't do anything, and then they brought all that crap in. Where were you, Sheriff? What were you doing? It's not what we do in Dodge County. We take 
get to the problem. When we know there's a, a, a group that is known for criminal activity, we are going to watch and we are going to act. Interesting conversation that I had with somebody earlier this week about the, the uh, owner of an establishment um, of one of the strip of one of, of a strip club said, "Man, you know this guy came in. He was talking to me. Just a really nice guy. And had these things happen to him, and I really feel bad for him." I said, "Why?" He's, got, he's really nice, he's got a nice little boy. Um, you know, it's just very, very nice to me. I said, you know, that's what they do, right? You know that they are very, very good at being con men, right? They will sweet talk anybody. They don't care. As long as they're getting what they want, they will sweet talk the pants off. Literally. Keep that in mind next time they come in and talk to you. Why are they talking to you that way? Because they are a professional con man. That's what these guys do. That's how they get their hooks into these women. They're professional con men. And they use them. And they start to gain their trust. And then they turn on them. That's how it happens. So, I thought we were going to hear a Wendy's story again tonight. It was a very riveting story the first time I heard it. A very powerful story about why she really got involved in this. Mm -hmm. Parents need to be watching your kids. You've got to be watching your, their cell phones. You've got to be watching the internet news. You've got to be watching, watching everything they do, and don't be their friend, be their parent. I hear it far too often. Don't be so hard on them. Let them do what they want. No. It is your responsibility until they are out of the house to make sure that they are safe, and then be on that too. To make sure that they are always safe, be their parent, um, and and, and uh, discipline is important. Who here? I, I know she read it because she has Facebook stuff. <laughs> <laughs> who, who read my article about after the uh, the Florida shooting um, regarding uh, parenting and and what we need to be doing? If you haven't read that article, go back and, and read it. I believe it would have been February article. It's on my that's on the Dodge Dodge County Sheriff. A website. Uh, just go to the uh, sheriff panel and read it. It talks about parenting. It talks about making sure that you are watching your children, making sure that you are being a good parent. Discipline is a good thing. It's not against the law to discipline your child as long as you're not crossing the line. It also talks about supporting teachers when they discipline and not questioning their authority. Teachers need to have that authority. I can't, that drives me nuts. When I see parents, well, my kid never did that. I get that. You know, when, when we show up at something, and, and I guarantee though those guys back there have had the same situation where they show up to a call, and some parent is, is saying, there's no way my, my child would ever, you're just harassing them. I appreciate your, uh, your concern, but I'm here bringing this to your attention so that you can correct it. Um, and, and it's unfortunate that you're not going to correct it because I'm going to, um, and we don't. We should be the parents. We should be the la the point of last resort. There are so many levels of authority before it comes to law enforcement. We should be the, the last, the point of last resort. You know, it, it shouldn't come to us. It should be parents, teachers, grandparents, neighbors. It should be okay for a neighbor to correct somebody when who's out in the public and and uh, doing something they shouldn't be without having the other parent come up to them and, and start screaming at them. Just got to do it appropriately. So, a lot of things that you can do. A lot of things that we need to do as a community. The police are the people and the people are the police. We're all on the same team. We all need to work together. I need your support. They need your support. Your neighbors need your support. Um, so, uh, just make sure that uh, when you see something, you say something. It doesn't matter. I, at that town climbing meeting, somebody asked me, I've got a private driveway at the end of a dead end road. And somebody pulled in and turned off their lights in my driveway. What do I do? It's 2 in the morning. I said, call me. <laughs> but it's 2 in the morning. Yeah. We're open 24-7, even on holidays. And if we can't get there right away, we'll get there as soon as we can. But call us, because chances are it's either a young child doing something they shouldn't be, or an older child doing something they shouldn't be, uh, whether it be sexual or drug-related or alcohol or whatever. It's not good when they're in, at the end of your property. Call us. That's what I want you to do. 
call us, take those steps, call, contact your supervisors, board members, legislators, let them know what you need to do. And, and uh, uh, we're never going to stop, but I guarantee you it's been going on as long as the Bible. Uh, but uh, we need to make an impact and do our best to save every survivor that we can. Um, and and uh, every, every one person we pull out of that is a win. Thank you for your time. So, okay, um, in regards of calling, so um, I know it can be intimidating to call the police department if you're calling with something that you're not sure you've even seen. And I, I just will speak from um, experience of calling the National Human Trafficking Hotline. I've thought, well, I talk about it all the time, I talk about it all the time, and tell people to put it in their phones. In fact, I'll pull it up here. I'll tell you to put it in your phones tonight, too. Um, but um, I have made a call. I have made a couple calls, and uh, it was all good. You know, it's people. You're on the along the line talking to another person, and they're asking information. So I want to just ask you, so when someone's going to call Dodge County Sheriff's Department, like, what do, what do they expect? What, they see something, and they're not sure what they see. What's that process look like? To kind of, can, you, can you tell us that? It's typically it's not going to be an emergency in that situation, so you're going to call our non emergency number. If it's an emergency, don't be afraid. Uh, if you're not sure if it's an emergency, don't be afraid to call anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, but when they call you, they are going to ask you a series of questions starting with oh, what's, who are you? I'm going to address that one first. You can be anonymous if you want to be. You can say, I would prefer not to leave my name. However, when you do that, it makes it much more difficult for us to get the information that we need. <coughs> take action and many times it's a drive-by if nothing's there we leave because we have no legal authority to be there if you leave your name and your phone number it certainly is helpful even if you call and say I don't want I want to be an anonymous in the report but here's my name and phone number and if the deputy would like to call me um, at least that's something we can at least keep you anonymous in that report but at least give us that if you say you want to be anonymous we cannot put your name in the report you're a confidential informant is really what you are, and the only way your name can be released is by a court order from the judge. Um, but uh, it's it's important to get that, that information. Next, they're going to ask you, what did you see? So be very detailed on what you saw. If you can safely get information, such as a license plate, a color, a make and model, um, if you see people, what did they look like? Are they wearing glasses? Are they, do they have facial hair? How many were there? Male, female? Um, what, what were they wearing? Um, those things. If you could take a picture safely, take a picture. Um, those are those are wonderful. Then you can pull it up and you can say, yeah, he's about you know, six foot tall, he's wearing a black shirt, blue jeans, and you give us an exact detailed uh, description. It's wonderful. Um, and then just tell us why why it is exactly that uh, you're calling. What, what is really suspicious? And uh, we'll take all that information and we'll send somebody out to take a look. Um, but it's a really easy process to do. It's, it's not hard at all. That this dispatcher will walk you through exactly what it is we need. Which brings me to my next question. Sorry, if anyone has questions, I'll get to you. <laughs> I'll get to you. Um, so the dispatch. Okay, so um, in 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 trying to find out how to engage local law enforcement in my process, um, uh, I I was at a uh, press conference where the attorney general was at, and by urging of a friend, okay, I hate that it's over here, um, to ask him. I practically inadvertently tripped over him and um, <laughs> in essence I had an opportunity to talk with him and I didn't do it, I tripped on a chair of course in my stack. And, um, but my main question, I said I was going to email him, I just had a question or two and he's like well what is it and I just wanted to know how to engage people in law enforcement on this topic um, and I, I guess and he, what his response was, was go to, directly to the people who are, and there's a question in here, Go directly to the people who are dealing with these sensitive crime issues. Okay, we're we're talking sex trafficking specifically, or you know that type of um, sexual exploitation. Do you recommend that we contact a particular officer in your department, or are we going to feel that we're getting the same sort of service <coughs> calling the dispatcher? Because would it be more helpful to give us a contact of someone we can call the desk of? Great question. For the suspicious activity that you see out and about, dispatch is the way to go. It's going to be the quickest way that we can get somebody there. If it's something that needs to be handled right now, dispatch is the way to do it. If it's something that 
that is a Tiffany type situation where we need to sit down and talk to somebody, then your best course of action is to come in during business hours to any law enforcement agency where you're at and say, this is a situation that I have. I feel it's important that I sit down and talk to a detective um, or, or somebody who handles these types of cases. Um, and if there's somebody available to do that, um, they certainly will. Um, sometimes you may still get a frontline officer or deputy, depending on what's going on, depending on that, that detective's case load. Uh, but typically they take, a, take the information, the initial information, and then they, they will forward that on to the right detective and then they get contact back. Um, and we're all human. From, not, from time to time, you're going to get a cop who's got a chip on their shoulder who's having a bad day. I'm, I'm just being completely honest with you. It happens. We deal with typically the worst 10% of the people 90% of the time. And sometimes it's very difficult for us to keep a positive attitude. Sometimes we have bad days, just like anybody else does. If that happens and you don't get the response you're looking for, then ask to talk, speak to a supervisor or ask to talk to the chief or to the sheriff um, and, and, and keep, keep uh, going. Because uh, we certainly don't want that to, to turn you off. Um, I say that not because it happens all the time, but because it does happen, and I want you to be prepared um, so that we don't let these things fall through the cracks, because we don't want that to happen. We certainly don't want our people to, to do that, but it's reality. We all have bad days at work, right? Cops don't. We're people, too. Um, so I just want to leave that caveat. Don't let one person prevent you from coming in and making a good report. So we'll take questions now. Remember, um, we got Detective Thickens and... Captain Martin Schultz, and if, if anybody has questions for Tiffany, she said, she told me that she's willing to answer questions or talk about the things she can talk about, but please don't be offended if she you know, ditches your question and moves on. I know that you all know that. I'm just saying that again in, in support of her. So is there any questions? Yes. Um, for Tiffany, she, she said she knew like three years ago what she knows now. Is there something specific that note, there's on um, that resource table, there's several, I think I've got at least two sheets on the grooming process and all detailed and the, the mentality that goes along with that, which is fascinating in a bad way, a terrible way, because these guys are so smart mm -hmm. and women too, they do it too. Anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Uh, one thing I'd, I'd like to mention, um, some of these ladies in the front row are from Five Stones Beaver Dam. Oh, yes. And um, we're a nonprofit organization, too, in the Beaver Dam area, trying to make people aware mm -hmm. of the issue of sex trafficking. And my question is, in, in this area, um, like we're going into the schools mm -hmm. as part of health classes to teach our kids, mm -hmm. um, middle school and high school, mm -hmm. and to teach them what to look for so they don't become a, a, a victim. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to say the word victim because at times, at the beginning, you are a victim, you know, until you can get out of that situation. So I'm just wondering, is there something like that going on in this area in Washington County, too? Or? So, um, where's Carol? Carol, Carol, Carol? So Carol and I have talked with um, a counselor at the high school, and we we are, the superintendent of the high school is involved in some of our meetings as well, and um, I think we are moving a little bit forward. I think there's a process there. It's in it's in their heads. It's there. We've been invited to come and talk um, to a class, but are you doing it like as a regular part of the curriculum? Yes. Because that's what yes. I. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because right. that's that is a definitely a focus for me personally. But I would like right. to see in high school. Yeah. I, mean, I have two. two and that's so important, you know, because we're getting the kids. Right. We're getting the kids educated. We feel it should be what to look for. Right. younger than that, even though it should start younger. Definitely. Yeah. We right. go in the middle school yeah. also. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Are you guys in the middle school at all? Yes. yes. In some place. Fantastic. Yeah. Nice. In Beaverdam, we're not in the um, school district, but they took our material and are teaching it. Oh. So who cares who does it? Just right. 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 If you can't get in yourself, they might be take more care. than willing to take your material yeah. and teach it themselves, because some schools are yeah. willing to let you come, let you come Very in. Very good. Thank you. So. Can I just Sure. Yes. That, that is so spectacular you're doing that. Um, there was a young girl I worked with, I'm an advocate for friends with Heidi, and this young gal, um, she's 15, and she had a mother and an aunt who had been raped, and they had educated her all the way through. If any boy touches you, something you don't like, you just let us know, you just let us know, and she was taught this for years. Well, little did mother know that the boyfriend had been molesting her for six years, and she had mentors and she had people to be there for her. The, what finally broke was this girl couldn't tolerate it anymore. She, she internalized it and, and tried to work and protect her siblings. And they feel that weight. So if there's some way of um, including those victims, they're there. And they're going to keep enduring. But if there's a way that you can reach them, because when this girl just finally you know, let her mother know, she ended up not believing her mm. because she had um, just yeah. been overwhelmed with this information and all these years you're telling me this happened. So be ready, I'm telling everyone, be ready. You might be hearing something that's so unbelievable that and that follow through needs to happen because this girl just gave it up one day, just decided that's it. So, um, that's fascinating because I did. I have another handout that um, <laughs> refers to. <laughs> sorry, um, how to react when you find when someone tells you something so traumatic that has happened to them. There's another handout for that too. It's not something we deal with on a normal daily basis. So your reaction is different. Yes. Yeah. Um, I also think that's great, but I also want to include like talking to the young men mm -hmm. about yeah. not being perpetrators mm -hmm. and like respecting women and equality. <clears throat> Also yeah, really important. definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what we it's do... For the whole class, it's not just for the girls. Sure. Right, yeah, it, they're combined together. And a, a gentleman in the back, I didn't see, I think it was you back there, um, research is showing more and more the connection between pornography mm -hmm. and sex trafficking. So when we do um, go into the schools, we talk to the boys about respect girls, you know, yeah. and we also tell them um, research that has actually shown that the more you watch pornography, it actually changes um, chemical imbalance in your brain and that you need more and more and watching it isn't enough. You're going to need to act on it. So we try to teach the boys to, you know, say no. Say no to pornography because that's, that's another yep. Um, yep. drug, yep. a new drug, pornography. So. Do you guys have the curriculum? That I mean, you could get a copy of it. Oh, I'm sure Tracy, our, our yeah. the founder, would be more than willing to. We could get your name afterwards and, and talk to you about it. I think it's totally on a separate thing, but coming from a counseling background, you know, I think the whole thing with cell phones and everything has so desensitized the whole issue of taking pictures of yourself, sending them over the phone, doing whatever. I mean, back when I would have never considered any of that, but I think now women don't view their bodies or girls as their property like that they used to. And I think that that starts this whole cycle of a lot of this stuff. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about social media in Delafield on Sunday. Um, I've got stories, yeah. I mean, it's definitely the desensitization is happening. I have seen it in my own kids. And when called called on it and asked, how could you not think this was inappropriate? This is how we live. These are our values. We are these kind of people. We don't do these things. Um, I learned that it doesn't matter what your values are and what you do in your home, what you believe and what you teach and all of that because they're getting bombarded by outside sources on a daily, regular basis on social media. My daughter has a flip phone now. She's 17 and she doesn't use it much because it's a little embarrassing. <laughs> However, <laughs> um, it, it is what it is because it, it's like we put too much faith in the fact that these kids 
can monitor this stuff that adults can't even control. Right? Well, yes, I guess what yeah. she was bringing up, talking to the boys about pornography and how it leads, I guess to me it's not just pornography with boys that age. Mm -hmm. Having just pictures of a girlfriend or something on your phone, that's crossing the line. It, you don't have to go as far as pornography. There's a lot of things yeah. that start down that process. Right. The, we have the saying that started, well, really it started with a, in the article and then uh, the don't, not just don't send, but don't ask. Don't ask, don't send. Nobody should be asking for you to send the pictures. Nobody should be sending the pictures. But we seem to focus on the girls. Don't and send them, don't send them. You should be taking them. these pictures, even if yeah. they're yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You shouldn't be yeah. taking them. And, and you shouldn't be asking. Don't ask your girlfriend or boyfriend for a picture. So, I mean, I, it really, again, goes both ways. Thank you for that. Um, my question is just generally for law enforcement. Um, I know for a lot of survivors, and actually next month, um, Rachel's probably going to touch on it about the work that she does to vacate records and that sort of thing. There's a lot of contact that survivors make um, with law enforcement, not relate while they're in the trafficking situation that's not related to trafficking. Do you guys have any education or interest in education and better identifying survivors of trafficking? Um, a separate police call. Oh. I would say we have interest in doing that. Um, we have begun that process. I've s not so much with our patrol. We're we're behind the curve. First to admit, we're behind the curve on investigating these things, even though it's been around forever. Uh, it's really come to the forefront, and people like this are the ones that are are really pushing it. Um, our detectives. Our investigators are really getting spun up on it. I don't know if it's any different for you guys, but I don't think our patrol staff is quite as spun up on it as we probably should be. Um, that's one of those. For the record, they're doing this. <laughs> yes. For, it, it, it's one of those things that uh, how much time do we have to train our staff to investigate all of these, these things? In law enforcement, we wear so many different hats. Not only do we enforce the laws, but we are social workers, juvenile workers. Then in the wintertime, when people's heat goes out, we have to fix their furnace for them. Um, and all these other things that come up, you laugh, but it's true, we get those phone calls. Um, we, we have to give directions, and you name it. And, and uh, we have uh, people asking us to do a training on, on uh, dementia patients, and autism, and all of these other trainings that keep coming up and it's one more thing, and, and it's very difficult for us to be able to do that, to give them all of that training, and still keep people out on the road doing their basic job, um, and, and rather than, than be the investigators. That's why I think we push it more to our investigation, investigative divisions, and allow them to focus on those a little bit more. We certainly talk about criminal interdiction. I think criminal interdiction is, is probably as close as we really get, because criminal interdiction is all the crimes. It's drug crimes, it's sex crimes, it's homicide, it's amazing. I mean, Jeffrey Donner was caught off with a license plate like being, um, being out. Um, all of those different things are into that criminal interdiction. We start to look for those things, look for inconsistencies. And when we see those inconsistencies in stories, then we can start bringing in our investigations and, and uh, working those bigger cases. I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts on that. I would just say that the, you know, the, the deputies that are on routine patrol, they're really the first line of criminal investigators. And so, I mean, they, they, they try to ask the important who, what, when, where, why questions. And hopefully that, um, you know, some of those questions would, would spark something in the, the deputy's mind that I can continue asking about this. Um, but like uh, the sheriff said, it's, a, uh, it's just a matter of trying to train. You know, the, the state mandates that we have uh, uh, a minimum of 24 hours of training, that's all that's really mandated per year. We have to fit in CPR, firearms, and all of our emergency wow. driving in that. So if it gets tight, we have to make some real decisions on what we train on. Deacon Steve, we talked. We've talked about the law enforcement. Like the, like this. This brings us to another point. Like where you're voting, where, where your where your vote can make a difference on things too. If people are so freaked out about ta taxes raising. However, the resources aren't available for some things. If and and I know that there's a lot of misuse and government money. Of course, we all know that. But um, can you expand on that I, without getting too political? <laughs> but how we can, you know, make a difference by um, how we vote. But this not, you know, taxes raising aren't always bad if they're being used for the right thing. 
I, I think if people want law enforcement to have all this training, people have to ask to have their taxes raised. Yeah. Um, in our work with the FBI's Human Trafficking Task Force and the Milwaukee Police Department Sensitive Crimes Unit, a million dollar grant had come forward so they could add two investigators. And, and people go, oh, that's a lot of money. But it's paying the salaries, giving them the vehicles, gives them an extra technician to be able to help sort evidence. These things aren't cheap. And down in the city of Milwaukee, and, and people like to think everything happens in Milwaukee. Well, they open up 500 investigations a year that are looking at trafficking. And, and they don't all involve Milwaukee, city of Milwaukee residents. More and more, the context of women we're having out on the streets are coming from the suburbs. Okay? It's, it's not a black problem, it's not a poverty problem, it's not a city problem. And, you know, it, you have to support law enforcement, you have to support social services to give them the tools, and I don't mean to call people tools, but to give them the resources. Because mm -hmm. if you want this, it takes time. You have to advocate. You have to say, I'm willing to pay. And this, if I might interrupt better yet, than even just voting for people, pick up the phone yep. and call them and, have, and let them know how important it is so that when us in the executive positions go and ask for the positions, they say, this isn't the first time you're hearing about it. Because if I go in there and I ask for more deputies or more training or more money for anything, and it's the first time that they hear about it, they're like, what does the sheriff want now? You know, why is he asking for this? The drug problem. I've had county board supervisors who have said, drug problem is a real problem. Why are we having this debate? We need to add more people. They've heard about it. They know about it. They're familiar with the problem. If they're not familiar with the problem, they're going to say, we don't have that here. Nobody's telling me about that. My, my constituents aren't saying anything about it. Pick up the phone and call them and tell them that there is a problem and tell them that you want help. Because once they start hearing about it, not from just one person, from multiple people, they will start bringing up the conversation. And they will say, hey, how about we throw some electric money your way for this? That's more effective than just going to the booth and, and voting. Tell them what we need. May any questions? Can I just speak to that just for a second? Yeah. Um, I think what you guys are doing as far as law enforcement is amazing. And Tiffany, for you coming forward is honestly one of the most beautiful and great things that I think everyone should be reminded of day in, day out. Because what you did could potentially have given a voice to what could be a world of people that we would never have even been able to touch. And so thank you for that. But I think the best part about that up there is it says law enforcement and community. And we keep saying, like, see something, say something. And we're like, yeah, if you see something, we'll say something. That doesn't always happen. Um, because that saying something could be really scary. It could put you in a really awkward position. Um, it could put you in an actually scary position. Um, some people have a hard time calling law enforcement so scary. And so I think for this issue is um, if we as a community started pushing back on people, I, and I've been brought to tears since this case has kind of come forward, but I still have people at my church that are like, what do we have around here? Or it's, well, it's that part of Hartford. Oh, so the other part of Hartford is oh. <laughs> that are, you're dumb if that's how you're going to look at life. And so what I have had um, kind of a revelation lately is when people are coming back and pushing and saying, like, that doesn't happen here, that is, and that's what Wendy does with all 900 of her sheets of paper, is she's got details of, yes, it does happen here. And so I'm challenging you guys in our community to say it does. And so, Tiffany, from someone that's in your community, I'm sorry that I never was able to be a part of that saying something. But if I were to have someone, and there's a lot of victims and survivors that were so drunk out on heroin, and you ask them why, and their response is that was the only way that kept them alive. So if I were to be able to call my law enforcement, not for a drug problem, but I could say, hey, they are so violently high, I'm, I'm thinking there's something else going on here, 
that could prompt the law enforcement to look at a perspective differently, to show up to a, 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 even just a simple driving um, over, you know, over the speed limit. If they were to be prompted differently, I think that's where us all coming in together, these pieces of the puzzle, is where we start to look at things differently. And it's just been very heavy on my heart is that we keep saying we're in this together and to see something, say something, but yet we still have people that are like, no, traffic only happens in the city, it only happens to certain people, and no, Tiffany, you said it. It happens to anyone, it happened to her. And it could happen to you, it could happen to your kids, and it's that perspective of we have to put those blinders on of this is happening around us, period. And so it is law enforcement community, it's you and me, it's us together doing this, because I think the perspective of this side of community and bringing things together are the only way this is gonna be stopped. Thank you. So I'm going to tell you this real quick, quick story. And, and I think it's really relevant just based on what you just said. Because, um, OK, I'm going to just condense it in a nutshell. It's not easy for me, but I will. So my daughter, my daughters, they, um, I hear some mumbling back there. <laughs> Tina Gallery. It's 8.06. I better sit down. Oh. <laughs> um, so my two daughters and a friend went to Chicago during Easter, their Easter break. And um, on, they took the train on the way back. Um, and I just found this out last night. My daughter just told me last night, my 17-year-old. Um, she said she was sitting and um, she saw this older man sitting across from her. And he was crying. And he was um, like visibly crying and, and, and to a point of some shaking. He had a suitcase, one little suitcase between his feet. And he was by himself. And he was an older man. My daughter said, I immediately started crying. We we're talking about feelings and sensitivity, and she picks up people's emotions and she feels them. And she's like, Why, you know, why do I, I feel like things that people are feeling? And, and she said, And I started, she said, She started crying. And I said, And then what'd you do? And she's like, I, um, I mean, I was more or less just listening. I do that sometimes. I really try hard. And I really was saying, What I wanted to hear from her um, was, I wanted her to unravel. The thing I was trying to get to, which was, what did you do? Nothing. Why not? I didn't say it like that, but that's what I was trying to get to. She said I didn't because it felt it felt like I should, because he was so sad and I was so sad. But yet she's like, I don't know him, and it made me just think of that when you said that, Marie, because um, we're so used to minding our own business that when we when our gut, our natural instinct is telling us, do something. Like, we're like, mm, I probably shouldn't. I said to my daughter, it would have been okay for you to go. She's like, I said, what did, you, what did you feel like you wanted to do? She's like, I would have liked to hug them. I just sat down next to them. And I'm like, you know what? You could have done that, just so you know in the future. Like, I wasn't, you know, obviously ridiculing. I was just like, you could have done that. And I said, just like I said to you, you didn't because we're all so trying to stay out of other people's business that we forget that, that sometimes we have to get in it to help them. We just have to. And so that's, that's, that's what my point is, so. I want to know how does your response to that? Get, get, getting in people's business? I've done a lot of talking. Maybe we should have those guys. Ah, yeah, you guys. Come on up here. <laughs> They're hiding. <laughs> Oh, go for it. Just go for it. I have a thick skin. <laughs> I don't know that I disagree. What? I don't know that I disagree. She wasn't alone, you said. See, no, she she wasn't alone. And then you know that she was with her sister and, and friend and they were sitting on a train with a bunch of other people. Oh my god. Yes. She get worried about them. Right. Stuff when fear very good for a guy that could be pretending. Very good point. Oh, very good point. Good point. <laughs> yeah. But that's the thing, we're so afraid that we lose yeah. our yeah. humanity. Much of these stories. I know. Okay, is everybody's ditching? So I guess we're okay. Quick, before we're done here. Um, okay, does anybody seriously have one last question? Something that they're like, I just wanted to ask. Everybody's good. Okay. Um, 
Okay, so you saw our next month's speakers. I want to point this out, and this is because um, these two women are fantastic. It's hard, to it's hard to track these two down for a presentation, let alone in the same room. So this is fantastic, thanks to our friends Patty and Todd Pence, so Pence over here who helped us track down um, Corrine and then uh, Rachel was supposed to be one of our speakers for last for a couple meetings ago that got canceled and she jumped at the chance, chance to present with Corrine because they've presented together on cases or um, worked together on cases, on, on real cases. So that's going to be a fantastic presentation. If you need more or want more information and you heard it but you don't know how to get a hold of it, email me. Um, get on our emailing list or take your many pieces of the puzzle, I'm on that. Um, if there's anybody you want to contact, I can just pass you on. I don't have all the answers, but I can pass you on to the people who do. Follow us on Facebook, and then I challenge you all to tell three people after you leave here about this, about what you learned today. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Everybody.